On today's episode, NASA and SpaceX have problems so big they reach all the way to Jupiter, while the European's newest rocket has an eventful first flight. They say timing is everything, and for America's leading space exploration ventures, NASA and SpaceX, a new series of unfortunate events couldn't have come at a worse time. On Thursday, July 11th, the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket experienced a failure in its upper stage Merlin engine. SpaceX later confirmed that this event has led to the total loss of the mission payload, which was 20 of the company's own Starlink satellites. What makes this story particularly surprising is the rarity of any mishap with the Falcon 9 system. This rocket has flown 364 consecutive missions across nearly eight years without any issue related to payload delivery. We've seen a few booster crashes and tip overs, but even those have largely become a thing of the past. And to be clear, the reusable stage of the vehicle again performed flawlessly on this latest mission. It came down for a textbook water landing, with SpaceX noting that this was their 70th mission of the year so far, which is an unprecedented launch frequency. The Falcon rocket system made a total of 96 launches in 2023, so SpaceX was on track to beat that record. And that's why the real surprise here is just how rare it is to see an issue related to Falcon 9. The only rocket we can really draw a comparison to would be Russia's Soyuz U variant, which flew 786 missions, and this was considered to be a very reliable system with a success rate of 97.3%. What we've been told by SpaceX is that the upper stage Merlin vacuum engine experienced a liquid oxygen leak during the initial burn towards orbital insertion. And we can definitely see an anomaly happen on camera. This is at T plus four minutes, seven seconds. That thing that looks like a bag of aluminum foil is something called a radiant barrier. It's like a thermal blanket that protects the engine's sensitive components like valves and sensors from radiant heat coming off the engine nozzle and the sun. On the flip side, it also prevents the kerosene liquid from freezing. Anyway, it's not unusual to see puffs underneath this barrier as the engine vents different gases and things, but then we start to see a lot of material leaking out from the Merlin engine, which then quickly becomes a very unusual buildup of ice crystals that form and then fall away and get blasted by the engine exhaust. It's all very fascinating to look at. Uh, and all of this didn't appear to have much effect on the primary burn of the upper stage engine. It kept on keeping on right to the end of the SpaceX live stream, which on a Starlink deployment will typically conclude with the booster landing. It was on the second burn of the upper stage that things started to go south. With the engine not able to relight, the vehicle couldn't circularize its orbit, meaning that the low point or the perigee of the ovular flight path was coming down to just 135 kilometers above the surface, which is less than half the altitude that was intended. Even so, the vehicle did still manage to deploy the 20 Starlink units. Now, at this point, atmospheric drag is going to start pulling those satellites down into the gravity well of the Earth every time they pass through that low spot, losing about 5 kilometers of altitude with each pass. The upside of this situation is that it now gives SpaceX an opportunity to experiment with the Starlink propulsion system. Elon Musk wrote on X, quote, we're updating satellite software to run the ion thrusters at their equivalent of warp 9. Unlike a Star Trek episode, this will probably not work, but it's worth a shot. The satellite thrusters need to raise orbit faster than the atmospheric drag pulls them down, or they burn up. The irony of ion thrusters is that in spite of their name, they actually have a very low thrust capability. Their real job is to gently push the satellite around once it's already reached its orbital velocity. So really, this operation was just delaying the inevitable demise of the satellite group, but it probably gave SpaceX a very useful stress test of what those thrusters are capable of when pushed to their extreme. Anyway, the satellites are likely to re-enter the atmosphere without issue. We've seen this happen before in February 2022, when a group of 49 Starlink satellites were hit by a geomagnetic storm, and that caused them to fall back down to the Earth. They all burnt up completely, so no big deal. 
Here's the real problem though. Falcon 9 is grounded until SpaceX can figure out exactly what went wrong. This is nothing to panic over, SpaceX just needs to diagnose the problem, decide on a solution, and submit everything in a report to the FAA. Then the rocket should be cleared for flight again. Typically this wouldn't be much of a problem, but there just happens to be a series of very high profile missions on Falcon 9 that are coming up quick. We have a cargo resupply mission to the ISS with a Cygnus spacecraft that's scheduled to launch in early August. And then the Crew-9 mission that's supposed to take four NASA astronauts on a Dragon capsule to the space station in mid-August. And then there's Polaris Dawn, which was recently set to launch as early as July 31st on a crewed mission that's intended to push the Falcon 9 and Dragon to their absolute limits. It's not likely that any of these flights will be able to go ahead until Falcon 9 is back in service and demonstrating reliability once again. Although this can all happen very fast if SpaceX is able to clearly explain the issue, make a fix, and then resume flying two or three missions per week. Of course, this wouldn't be such a big deal right now if NASA had a functioning backup to the SpaceX launch system, but their only other crew capsule, the Boeing Starliner, remains deeply troubled in its extended stay at the ISS and is unlikely to be flying astronauts again anytime soon, if ever. And NASA is also relying on the heavy variant of the Falcon rocket for one of their highest profile flagship outer space exploration missions ever conceived, the Europa Clipper. This is set to launch in October 2024, and it will make a five-year trip to the orbit of Jupiter, where it will go on to study the deeply fascinating moon Europa. Or at least, that's the plan right now, but a new technical challenge could put the entire mission in jeopardy. On the same day that SpaceX experienced their Falcon 9 issue, NASA released a statement about the Europa Clipper mission, saying that progress was moving forward on the spacecraft and that the team had recently attached the high gain antenna, which is good. But the release also says that NASA is dealing with a potentially faulty transistor inside the Clipper's electronics which is very bad. The problem comes down to a supplier of transistors, which are basically just little switches inside of an electrical circuit. They're incredibly common, but also incredibly important. And these particular transistors in question are not meeting the standards necessary to operate in the extreme environment of the outer solar system. NASA writes, quote, Testing data obtained so far indicates some transistors are likely to fail in the high radiation environment near Jupiter and its moon Europa, because the parts are not as radiation resistant as expected. Because Jupiter is so incredibly humongous and massive, it has an equally large and powerful magnetic field that surrounds the planet. It's 20,000 times greater than the Earth's own magnetic shield. And this barrier traps charged particles from the sun, then concentrates them together, creating an intense band of radiation around Jupiter that the moon Europa ends up traveling through, which means that our spacecraft will need to pass through the same radiation belt in order to study Europa, which makes the need for radiation-hardened electronics even more important than any other deep space mission, which is why it's so deeply frustrating that this happened to be the one that got screwed up. The mission profile of Clipper is already designed to limit radiation exposure as much as possible. So instead of orbiting close around Europa, it's going to make a long elliptical path through the Jupiter system that dips down to the moon once every few weeks and then flies back out to escape the radiation belt. This will limit the overall radiation exposure and allow the probe to gather and transmit more data. Clipper is already being built with a radiation vault that houses the sensitive electronics in the core of the spacecraft. It has aluminum alloy walls that are one third of an inch thick. NASA's engineering team is working to determine how many transistors may be susceptible and how they will perform in flight. The agency will continue evaluating options for maximizing the transistor's longevity in the Jupiter system, and a preliminary analysis is expected to be completed in late July. On July 9th, 2024, Europe's space ambitions took a giant leap forward with the inaugural flight of the Ariane 6 rocket. Lifting off from the Kourou launch site in French Guyana, this historic moment begins a new era in European space exploration. 
The launch, initially delayed due to a data acquisition system issue, proceeded flawlessly. Just over two minutes into the flight, the solid boosters separated at an altitude of 62 kilometers. The Vulcan 2.1 engine, powered by liquid hydrogen and oxygen, cut off as planned just under eight minutes after liftoff. The first separation command occurred one hour and five minutes into flight, deploying three satellites, OOV Cube, Curium-1, and Robusta-3A, at a circular orbit of 577 kilometers. Experiments YP-SAT and Peregrinus attached to the upper stage were also successfully initiated. However, a serious issue with the auxiliary power unit then affected the Vinci engine's ability to reignite. Despite this, the mission was able to proceed. A passivation maneuver of the upper stage was planned for 2 hours and 40 minutes into the flight, ensuring a safe conclusion. The final operation was designed for the components to re-enter the atmosphere and descend into the Pacific Ocean as part of the deorbit maneuver. Ariane 6 is an expendable rocket, and this decision is rooted in Europe's relatively low planned launch frequency of about 10 launches per year, and reflects a pragmatic approach to their current economic realities. However, Europe is already investing in future reusable rocket technologies, with projects like Themis and Prometheus, which are aiming to deploy a reusable successor to Ariane 6 by the 2030s. Cost effectiveness was a primary driver of the design of the Ariane 6. The 62 variant, equipped with two solid side boosters, can launch up to 5,000 kilograms to geostationary transfer orbit at an estimated cost of $75 million for launch. This translates to about $4.7,000 per kilogram to GTO, which is a 44% price reduction compared to its predecessor, the Ariane 5. The more powerful 64 variant with four side boosters can lift up to 10,350 kilograms into low Earth orbit at a cost of about 85 million per launch, or roughly $8.2,000 per kilogram. Despite these improvements though, Ariane 6 faces stiff competition from SpaceX, whose Falcon 9 offers launches to GTO at around $2.7,000 per kilogram. Herman Ludwig Moyer of the European Space Policy Institute highlights Ariane 6's role in securing Europe's place in the new space economy. The launcher aims to defend Europe's independence in launching its own payloads and securing major commercial contracts, with over 30 missions already scheduled, including 18 dedicated to Amazon's Project Kuiper, Ariane 6 is poised to make a significant impact. After this successful maiden flight, Ariane 6's launch schedule includes one more mission in 2024, six in 2025, and eight in 2026. The goal is to achieve a steady cadence of around 10 launches per year once fully certified.